Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon with everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, webinar session today. Today we're going to cover uh, uh, prevention research at CROI 2016, the conference that took place two weeks ago. And it's going to be an informal conversation with Linda Gale Becker and Jim Pickett. Um, are, are you are you guys there, Linda Gale and, and Jim? Can you hear me? Yes, indeed. Hey. Okay. I'm here. Yes, Carlos. Okay, great. Thanks. So, well, well, let me just say that the conference uh, took place two weeks ago, and important findings were presented uh, in uh, relation to HIV biomedical prevention research, including data from topical prep trials. You know, particularly the RIN study and ASPIRE, then the ECLAIR trial uh, focused on long-acting PrEP with cabotegravir, and, and also the HPTN-09 trial with Maraviroc containing regimes. And um, the idea today was to have an informal conversation with uh, Linda Gale Becker and Jim Pickett. So uh, Linda Gale, let me just introduce both of them, although, I mean, everybody knows them, but uh, I would just say, Linda Gale is a, a deputy director of the Desmond Tutu HIV Center at the Institute of Infectious Disease and Molecular Medicine at the University of Cape Town, Chief Operating Officer of the Desmond Tutu HIV Foundation. She's a physician scientist with a keen interest in HIV, TB, and related. Uh, well, um, uh, her uh, summary is in the invitation. I will also say that uh, in 2016 she will assume her role as <coughs> president of the International Aid Society for three years. So she's going to do that actually in the Durban conference that's going to start in, that's going to happen in July. Regarding Jim, Jim is director of, of prevention advocacy and gay men's health at the AIDS Foundation of Chicago where he has worked for the last 11 years. He founded and leads the International Rectal Microbicide Advocates and heads uh, uh, up the efforts of the Chicago PrEP Working Group. In February, the Working Group released a brand new PrEP media campaign called PrEP for Love, and uh, called by the website uh, prepforlove.com. Then <coughs> uh, Post Magazine has honored his efforts in 2010, 11, and 12 by uh, including him in the magazine's top 100 uh, lists of a soldier instrumental in fighting, fighting for much needed new prevention methods and third by subjects many would prefer to ignore. Anyway, uh, Jim <coughs> is uh, also a well known activist working in this for a very long time. So, anyway, we are both, uh, they are both going to share their ideas with us today <coughs> and uh, we hope to have a, uh, a, a discussion um, more broadly with other participants today as well. This, is, this session is going to be recorded as uh, uh, we do all the time, <coughs> and we'll share the, the, the uh, webcast later. Uh, we'll be receiving comments and questions through the window, uh, uh, chat window as well. So, <coughs> any of you would like to start with your I mean, informally, your impressions. Uh, I know that Linda have also uh, uh, obtained permission to, to share some slides with us. But I mean, the, again, this is a, an informal session, mainly oriented to people who were not at the Chicago uh, at the at the uh, Croy conference and would like to to get more into into the details of the information presented. But also for people who were there and would like to. To, to, to share an informal discussion. Anyway, uh, would you would you like any of you like to start? Sure, Carlos. So Linda Gale here, and it, um, perhaps you know, I'll just it's no surprise I think to everyone that um, a great part of the Boston meeting was really just to recognise that the prep the pre-exposure prophylaxis options are expanding. So, you know, I think um, Jim will want to speak a little bit more about oral prep, as we know, Truvada and what we are learning there. But I thought um, I would just um, outline for people who may not have been there that we heard about the very exciting long-acting um, products that 
are being used for both treatment and prevention. And we saw uh, some more data, um, the LATE2 study, which is a long-acting rolpivirine with long-acting carbotegrava in treated uh, patients. We saw it out to week 32. Um, and certainly this, I think, is going to revolutionize how we treat our patients going forward. So for those of you who don't know about this, we're looking at basically six shots uh, per annum, maybe moving to three or four shots per annum. Uh, that would really uh, conclusively sort out people's treatment regimens. So uh, we are also looking at both those products as uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis agents. Um, and there was uh, some discussion around uh, those agents in pre-exposure. We saw some more animal data and so on. I can come back to some more detail about that in the moment. We also saw new data on Moravaroc. Um, and this is the R5 inhibitor that many will know first made its debut into treatment, has not really gained of, um, uh, favoritism or, or enthusiasm in the treatment world and, it, and many people feel that it is definitely more suited for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And so we saw some nice data in an interesting design where everybody got a product um, and it was, a, it, it was, I think, a five-arm study where it was a mixture of Moravaroc with, with and without either Tenofova or Intracitabine. Um, and so that five-arm study, I think, gave us some detail around certainly adverse events, uh, tissue levels, and, and I think Moravaroc re remains very much in the fold. Uh, we also saw data on the new um, prologue for Tenofova called TAF. Um, many of the listeners will have heard about this agent. It needs far less chemical, if you like, in the blood and therefore uh, will cost less and will have fewer side effects. And we saw the first treatment, or well, we've been seeing it in the treatment world, but we saw some more data in treatment. We saw some animal data in PrEP and we also saw the first of the oral, um, a small study of oral use of TAF. Uh, for PrEP. And then there was definitely some conversations about the new formulations coming down the, pack, the pike and, and perhaps the most exciting there just because it was the end of, a, of two phase threes, um, that is the depivirine vaginal ring. And I certainly am happy to give a bit more detail about that for anyone. Uh, but the new formulations excitingly uh, include putting ARVs into an implant, um, and there are also some new agents, uh, very exciting, coming down the pike, which might mean, you know, literally an annual um, uh, need for dosing. So uh, along with the vaginal ring, we also saw films and we saw, as I say, um, a little bit of conversation about implants. And then finally, a whole new way of thinking. There was a fantastic plenary from John Mescola on uh, monoclonal antibodies. And certainly um, very tantalizing that the you know monoclonal antibodies such as VRCO1 could be used as a pre-exposure prophylactic agent as well. So these are, if you like, agents that you know cling wrap um, the antigen or the HIV and, and move it out of the body. Um, and so has been very much in the in the world of passive immunization. Uh, but it was discussed at, at Boston what the possibilities were for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And just to, rem John reminded us that um, the southern region of Africa is just gearing up together with uh, a number of sites in the Americas uh, to start the passive immunization study uh, called AMP, uh, which will be looking at VRCO1 um, as a, a prevention strategy for HIV infection. So I'll, I'll stop there for a moment and just see what, you know, what sort of other conversations that has brought up. And as I say, I'm happy to give a little more detail about the vaginal ring should anybody want that. Great. Um, we'd like to comment something, Jim. 
Sure, thank you, and thank you for having me on this call, and it's lovely, it's always lovely to share a conversation with Linda Gale Becker and all the attendees, many of whom I can see I know. Um, so nice to be here. Uh, it was a very exciting conference. I would definitely love to have you, Linda Gale, give a little more detail and, on Aspire and the Ring Study and talk about next steps. I think a lot of uh, both scientists and advocates felt some concern at CROI. There seemed to be um, some hesitation from the National Institutes of Health and others around moving forward with an open, a planned open label uh, study for the Aspire participants, which had a lot of us, um, you know, concerned and upset. Um, while we had a number of uh, efficacy estimates that came out of that study that makes it a little confusing, anywhere from in the 20 percentile range up to 60, and differentials by age, um, definitely seeing there was strong enough results to move forward with an open label and to find out when women know they're getting an active product that has been proven to work that is safe. Um, Will their, you know, will adherence be improved? Uh, for the younger women where it didn't seem to work so well under 21, we need to understand um, what was going on there. Was that all adherence or was, there, was, it, was it mostly biology or was it some complicated mixture of both? Uh, so I know there's a big meeting happening today at the National Institutes of Health to talk about what happens with um, the ring from their perspective, from, with the Pivoring Ring and the Aspire study. And we have seen in the press, uh, Dr. Fauci has, um, you know, said positive, favorable things about funding the study. Uh, today it's happening, so I think we all need to, you know, cross our fingers and hope that that hope that the Hope study, it's actually called Hope, is the open label, moves forward. And and if it doesn't move forward, I think we need to um, make a lot of noise. I think it would be absolutely reprehensible not to move forward with an open label study of a product that has been shown to be effective. Um, it may not be a, uh, something that we would consider for prime time in the United States where the epidemic is mostly among gay men, but certainly in sub-Saharan Africa where the epidemic is hitting uh, women, young women, very, very hard, where they bear the brunt of the epidemic. Um, even something in the 20, high 20s to 40s, 50s, all of that would be extremely important and could reduce so much pain, suffering, um, loss of health, and loss of life. So that's one thing I wanted to comment on. I, I uh, would like to mention that the first ever phase two study of a rectal microbicide gel was presented. Um, so this was phase two. We didn't get uh, efficacy data. It was uh, acceptability and safety. It was a very interesting study. Uh, Irma, the group that I work with, partnered with the MTN and did community consultations all over the world to um, help design the study and design the protocol and make sure it was uh, made sense in different contexts. And this study took place in Thailand and Peru, South Africa, uh, and uh, some, some sites in the United States, including Puerto Rico. So it was a really exciting study. Um, it did show that uh, people found it to be safe and acceptable for the most part. People were able to use the product. Um, it was a interesting study design. Everyone kind of followed um, different regimens of the product at different times. Everyone used the product every day, the product being a, a gel applied with a vaginal applicator. So that was one arm where people applied it every day. Everyone also had the opportunity to apply it uh, before and after sex. And then everyone also was invited to be part of a, an arm where they took daily Truvada. And then they could compare, contrast what people thought about each modality. Interestingly, people overall preferred the daily pill to any of the gels. Um, outside of the daily pill, people then uh, preferred um, the gel being associated with sex. So no one, not no one, but a lot of people aren't that excited about putting a gel up your butt every day, uh, whether or not you're having sex, but it made sense around the time of sex. I will say that um, we can discuss this further because uh, I don't want to get lost in the weeds here at the moment, but what this means for the rectal microbicide field going forward is something we probably want to talk about. Um, we're not, you know, the field is not moving forward with a phase three of tenofovir gel, uh, rectal tenofovir gel applied with a vaginal applicator, and I can talk about that in a bit. The last thing I just wanted to bring up was there was a lot of interesting PrEP implementation data. I think one of the key things that came up for me and a lot of us who've been working in the field is, uh, 
you know, how STD screenings fit into the PrEP program because PrEP is much more than a prescription. It's a, much more than a daily pill. It includes regular HIV testing and, and STD screening and treatment as necessary, counseling, sexual health stuff, adherence, blah, blah, blah. So um, the CDC have put out guidelines a couple years ago that calls for screening every six months. And then just asking about symptoms uh, in the other two visits a year. If you're seeing someone four times a year, two of those visits would be STD screenings, and the other two would just be asking about symptoms. And a number of, a couple of presentations showed very clearly that doing that missed a lot of STDs. If you are only screening twice a year, you're missing a substantial amount of STDs. So there was a strong recommendation coming from Dr. Sarik Gulub from Calvin Lord and others to to change the CDC guidelines to quarterly. And you know, she made a really good point. While much of the world has not um, approved PrEP and we're still you know, amping this up across the world, the countries keep ticking up, but we still have a lot of work to do, it would be better to start kind of with a strong protocol up front than try to change something midstream. For the United States, you know, it would be a bit of a change. Uh, although I do know that there are providers who are doing quarterly screenings anyhow. But for the rest of the world, as they're figuring out what to do and how to, how to plan how they deliver PrEP and what the programming is around it, um, it seems to me that quarterly screening makes a lot of sense. And you catch a lot of asymptomatic STDs that way. So with that said, I will stop blabbing and turn it back over to uh, Pedro and the team and Carlos. Great. Um, so perhaps just before that, I will share. So everyone, this is um, this is a, an unusual presentation in that it's showing both the Aspire, which is uh, NTN 020, and the Ring study, which was run by IPM, and it's IPM 027. Uh, and so for the first time ever, this wasn't even shown at Croy, we're showing you both studies side by side. And I'll move through it relatively quickly because I think we also want time for discussion and just for some natter. Um, but thank you, Jim. It's always a pleasure uh, to share the, the stage with you. And I'm hoping we'll hear a little bit about the beautiful uh, PrEP campaign that was launched uh, at Boston as well. And, and, you know, Jim was very much the author of that. So I hope we'll have a moment to talk about that. Um, yeah. Just coming back to the vaginal studies, both were multi-center, both randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, uh, with the endpoints of safety and efficacy. And both were run in um, southern and eastern Africa. The product that was, if you move, uh, well, I have moved to the second slide. The, the product was the dipiverine ring. Um, and dipiverine is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So you see that it's a... Um, you know, it's an off-white flexible vaginal ring that is inserted, self-inserted by the woman, and it sits in the vaginal fornix. So it's quite high up. The woman does not feel it if it's put in well, um, and also, by and large, her partner does not feel it if she's having vaginal sex. Um, it was this ring has been developed by IPM, um, and there you see how it's come to actually be in the field. Uh, to date, in the preclinical work, there really has been no safety issues at all. So it's a it's a topical uh, microbicide or topical prep agent sitting in the vagina, and it needs to be changed every 30 days. So the woman has to come in every 30 days for a change. So. In order to try and speed up licensure, which I think is an interesting concept in its own right, um, these two parallel phase three trials were conducted uh, simultaneously with similar endpoints. Um, and in order to go to licensure, it's important that both trials needed to be safe and have statistical significant levels of efficacy. So statistically significant means these results did not occur by chance. Um, and the statistical difference between two treatments is the st statistical evidence that there is a difference between the two treatments being tested. So in this case, um, a, a combination package that did not contain dipiverine ring versus a combination package that did contain dipiverine ring. 
So comparing the two arms, the ring study was randomized in a two to one and you see just under 2,000 women were randomized and they were aged 18 to 45. Um, and in the Aspire arm, it was a more typical one-to-one -one randomization of just over two and a half thousand women. Um, and uh, just to show you where this happened, the ring study involved seven research centers around South Africa with one site in Uganda. Um, and the Aspire study was NIH run, hence Jim's uh, comment that the NIH is considering these results today. Um, these were 15 clinical trial sites in South Africa, uh, East and Central Africa, so uh, those countries as you note there. So a good range of women from around South, Central and East Africa. And um, again, just helping you to understand uh, the two-to-one randomization of dipirine to placebo in the ring study and the one-to-one -one in Aspire. Um, typical sort of uh, population was enrolled, so you see young. In the ring study, mean age was 26. Most women were single. Um, uh, you know, 98% reported having a, a particular partner, reasonable amount of sex being had, um, and very similar in the Aspire. So again, mean age 26, a few more married because we go out of South Africa and into East Africa, more women are married young. Um, and uh, the two arms were really well matched with respect to demography in both studies. When we're looking at the efficacy um, uh, assessment, we uh, thought about the primary efficacy analysis, as usual, is a modified intention to treat using all seven research centers for the ring study with complementary analysis uh, where one research center where this, the, the participants were less than adherent to the program and to the ring was excluded. So this was a priori allowed in the protocol that we um, or, or during the conduct of the study, the DSMB agreed uh, that this research center could actually be put on the side. So this MITT excluded that research center. There was also an MITT looking at product adherence and an MITT looking at time varying product adherence analysis. Um, and I'll come back to that. Uh, on the Aspire side, there were two primary intention to treat analyses. One considering all 15 sites, and one where, again, the protocol allowed us to drop up to two sites uh, that did ha where adherence was less than ideal, um, and those had to be predefined. So that is just the background of how the efficacy analyses were carried out. Um, and now moving on to, um, I wonder why, uh, why am I not able to move this down. Let me see if I, oh, there you are. Um, so here are the results, and many of you have seen or heard about this now. Um, as Jim says, the world saw this either as a glass half full or a glass half empty. And um, for those of us who are here in the deep south where young women have very few options and you see these kinds of conversion rates, some sites up to 15% incidence at their sites. You really do think that 31% is a result that we can build on. It is something that is much better than nothing and uh, you know definitely needs to be considered in our armamentarium of prevention. So for those of us down here, we believe these are significant results that need to be paid attention to, and we need to say how can we build on these results. So um, in the ring study, we saw overall um, on our primary analysis a 31% reduction in HIV seroconversion, and on the ASPIRE side, um, a, a significant 27% reduction uh, in incidence. Um, and when you look at the curves, there you see them. You see on the Aspire an initial struggle, and that may be those two additional sites where adherence was less than perfect, and then a very nice splitting of the of the Kaplan Myers there showing 
there was more infection happening on the placebo arm than in the treatment arm. And similarly, in the ring study, you get that separation, um, which appears to be fairly well sustained throughout the study. We start to lose numbers in the ring study. I just want to remind people that the Aspire study had come to an end. We knew the results, and those results had to be shared with the DSMB of the ring study. So given the results of Aspire, the DSMB of the ring study um, felt that it was no longer possible to continue the study with a, a blinded uh, placebo arm. And so they have asked that the placebo arm of the ring study gets converted to a dipirine ring uh, positive um, intervention. And so you see the numbers uh, beginning to decrease there because the study has, has for the moment, been put on hold. Um, and we are quickly moving people into uh, an open label kind of approach. Um, so the other very important question that I think uh, Jim alluded to is and w was one of the uh, analyses that was uh, allowed to be done. It is a, a post hoc analysis, but I think important to do is that where we break out age. And uh, there's a lot of information on that slide, but suffice to say that the under 21 year olds in both studies did not fare well. They, they, didn't, they had the lowest uh, impact, in fact, on Aspire, there was no impact um, on, on the ring study. There's a, there is a very wide confidence interval that crosses zero. Um, however, the picture changes uh, when you look at the over 21-year-olds. So particularly in Aspire, you'll see there a very you know, reasonable 56% in the over 21-year-olds. Um, and 51% in the older woman in, uh, than that. So we definitely see a, a better impact in women who are older. Um, and I'm not showing the slide, but when we looked at that by adherence, it's clear that the problem is, Jim, uh, seems to be mostly about use of the ring, consistent use of the ring, rather than biology. Although we do want to keep biology in our minds because we haven't completely proven that, but certainly adherence seems to be playing a big role here. And adherence, as we know, always you have to use these products, whether you take them orally or whether you put them in your vaginas or you put them in your rectum. Um, and so you see here uh, in this slide a, um, a dose response curve. So the cutoff ring residual level, this is how much dipirine was left in the ring when the ring was removed. And obviously, if it's been there for a long period of time, more drug will have leached out. So there's 25 milligrams in a ring, and you can see if you've leached out 5 uh, milligrams and you've dropped to 20, then you have much better um, results, up to 65% um, reduction in incidence. So uh, if anybody wants to email me afterwards, I'm willing to engage more about these details. Adverse events were literally non-existent. I won't go into that. This is a, a topically applied agent, and there really is nothing to worry about there. Um, on the resistance side, we also saw very little that would worry us about resistance. Uh, but these, this is a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor, and so we do want to keep resistance on our mind. So the summary is, you can think about this easily as about a third reduction in incidence uh, in women who are, have a very high rate of HIV uh, risk. And in this slightly older group, it seems that we do get better use of the ring and therefore better results. Um, and so this product is safe, well tolerated, not associated with increases in drug resistance. It had a reduced acquisition of somewhere between 31 and 27 percent. The protection was greater in subgroups where there was better adherence. And you have to know the incidences in these women in this part of the world are scary. Um, and here's something that we can build on and develop and see where it should go. So I'll stop there and hand back to the team uh, if there's any questions anybody wants to ask. Or well, Jim, you've already made such great comments. I, I couldn't agree more that I think, you know, we have to see how this product 
looks in an open label environment um, to see if we can particularly work on those young women when they know that they've got a product that works. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Great, great, Linda. Uh, Linda Gale, excellent summary on those two very important studies. Jill Gay had one question regarding potential use of, for HIV negative women during pregnancy. And then Robert, Robert Shore had, had a question as well. Uh, so, um, but since it's a longer question, would you like uh, to make that question yourself, Robert? If... Mm, okay. Okay, you, you can turn off your mic because I already, um, see, you, you pr press your mic at the participants list. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You can speak now. Go ahead. Uh, we don't sp we, we can't hear you. Maybe you have a problem with your mic. I, we can read your your question anyway. Okay. Uh, what what Robert is uh, asking is, uh, can presenters discuss the protection the vaginal ring may or may not provide the non-vaginal sex uh, with possible exposure to HIV? Are systemic drug levels high enough to potentially protect from infection entry? A now, and then. Uh, Again, he said, if, if you see the, name res the same results uh, in terms of risk reduction in the open label as in the trials to date for the vaginal ring, would that support approval? Do we need better results or is uh, even a 25% reduction in risk enough for these sub-Saharan areas with such high levels of infection? I don't know what, what would you like to, to comment on that, Linda Gale or Jim? Well, perhaps I'll I'll pick up on the on the whether we can be protected um, through other routes. So whether you know uh, rectally or intravenously, I, I would say no. Uh, this product is to protect against vaginal exposure um, of the HIV, and and that's important. So I think it's really important that women are educated, um, and you know it it absolutely confirms. Also, the need to keep working with Irma and seeing whether rectal products can, can also be developed. We know that women do have anal sex, but it's important that they realize uh, that if that's happening currently, they need to be thinking about oral prep to protect um, both mucosal surfaces. Uh, but if they are not having anal sex, only vaginal, then this is a product that could work for them. But the message is, the more exposure that the vagina has to the ring, the better. So in other words, you really need to keep the product in for as many of the 30 days as possible. Um, Jim, I don't know if you want to pick up the, is this good enough? Sure, yeah, I think, uh, I think you made the case, Linda Gale, that it is good enough, that even something in the high 20s, low 30s, while it may not sound spectacular, um, especially when we're now talking about Truvada prep at around the 99% level, if you know, used consistently and correctly. Um, when we're talking about an epidemic that is just raging across sub-Saharan sub Africa and so many women are at such vulnerability that uh, reducing a third of those new infections is pretty freaking amazing. So um, yeah. I know I would support moving forward in that context, and it seems to me that based on what you just said, Linda Gale, you would agree with me on that. Yeah, and I, I'd add two things to that, Jim. The one is, first of all, that we, you know, we go against the buck not to see improvement. There isn't an open label that we have done that is not improved on the randomized controlled trial data. So, you know, except maybe Proud, which was already, well, in fact, you know, that was already so up there, and it wasn't truly um, a randomized control trial where we were saying, you know, we don't know if this thing works, and by the way, you could be getting a complete sham product. Um, people would knew, you know, where they were, and they knew whether they were getting a product or not. So, um, so the, that, that, that would be the first piece is that, the, the trend is that things get better when you tell people to use it because it works. 
And then the second piece that um, you know I think is important here in the risk benefit ratio is we really are seeing no systemic impact at all. So you know whilst on oral prep you could still weigh up well there are still some side effects you know you are taking an ARV on board although they're minimal and they disappear for some people that's tough to do on in this product we really are seeing no systemic effects at all so for me that kind of that also tips the balance a bit more you might you, you might accept less efficacy when you've really got no downside uh, to the product except cost and obviously if we can drive the cost down that that will also be a big plus. Those are great points, and I would I would add one more. I think you know we're we're still in the infancy on, on many of these products and how we're developing them. And I think as we move forward, making uh, something like a ring um, offer multiple benefits, so multi-purpose technologies, yeah. adding a yeah. contraceptive to an anti-HIV would be amazing. And it would, I think it would improve acceptability. It would make it easier to discuss this with, with male partners. Um, you know, concerns about uh, conception and when you, when you want to have children are often easier to discuss than worries about, hey, you might be infecting me with HIV. I need to wear this ring. Um, yeah. If you can add a contraceptive to that, it's huge. And so there's a lot of work going into moving that forward. And I think we have to do our level best with what we have now. We know Truvada as prep isn't perfect. Um, we have to do our level best with it, though, and we know that the the delivery ring uh, is not perfect, but it could make a huge impact and lead us, continue to lead us towards better things that can continue to improve, um, in this case, women's health and wellness. Great. Uh, great. There was one uh, last question, perhaps, on this topic from Butch. Um, he says, I, know, I noticed the high number of women who screened uh, were no, select, no selected. What were the main reasons for exclusion? Sadly, HIV infection, overwhelmingly. So, uh, women come to these trials hoping that, you know, they can participate only to discover that they're HIV infected. Oh, that's that's really pretty sad. It's true. Mm. Mm. Any, anyway, and, and uh, there was one more question. Just I don't want to forget it. I saw someone asked about, um, and Linda Gale, you probably know this. What we know, if anything, at this moment about depivering ring and um, women seeking to become pregnant or during pregnancy. Yeah. So um, you know, unfortunately, as often is the case with uh, with randomized controlled trials, when you know we're still relatively feeling still a bit newbie about putting it into humans, um, that pregnancy is an exclusionary um, uh, factor. So when we discovered that women were pregnant, we took, we stopped the depivering ring use. However, all of those women have, or we offered those women the opportunity to move into a pregnancy follow-on study. Um, so they've been followed up real time. And we are following up their babies and themselves um, right into young neonate life uh, to make sure that there's no impact. Um, and one of the studies that clearly would be on the cards if, if indeed you know, we have the money and the political will is to do bridging studies. So bridging studies would include looking particularly at women who are pregnant um, and also looking at young women because that we obviously haven't cracked that nut and we have to keep working at at the you know the under 21 year olds mm -hmm. excellent I, uh, there if we are moving on there were there are a couple of uh, questions that are about new I mean, different topics and then I hope we can uh, speak on uh, prepare for love at, at the end uh, definitely uh, Jim no I, I heard you gave a great, a fantastic presentation in, in, a, in at Indeed. Croy. So we really would like to, to hear more about it. But before that, uh, Jill asks if there are any new data uh, uh, presented on uh, uh, interventions for those under 18, both living with HIV and uh, at risk. No, that's one question. And then um, the other topic would be no, but we, I mean, we can take some time in each of them. The other one is about uh, efforts uh, for PrEP implementation, particularly among men who have sex with men and transgender women. So yeah, those are in 
different important topics. So maybe we can start with, with the first one with young people uh, under 18. <clears throat> So, Jill, yes, maybe I'll just tell you that, um, you know, the only under-18 studies, certainly on oral PrEP at the moment, as you well know, um, are Sybil Hosek, the ATN studies uh, ongoing in North America at the moment. So that's um, ATN 110 and 113. Um, and that data, very excitingly, the follow-on data and the initial data is going to be presented at Durban. So I'm going to put in a nice advertisement here for Durban 2016. I know that those abstracts are going in there. So we will get the definitive data, I think, about those uh, young MSM oral prep studies. And we will also present at least the preliminary uh, first look data on plus pills, which is our little prep study being done here in Soweto and Cape Town in 15 to 19 year olds. So that oral prep, it won't be finished, but we will show some interim data. It's an open label study, so we can show interim data in Durban. And so we're hoping we haven't yet seen whether we we've, we've got onto the we've you know made the mark, but we hope our abstract will be accepted there. So um, so not too much new um, biochemical or biomedical uh, data coming through on the prevention side, but hopefully we will soon begin, begin to see more uh, of that happening. I know that there's some really important studies either about to launch or launching and some excellent demonstration projects, notwithstanding dreams um, and other things that are getting off the ground. So, so watch that space. On the treatment side, there was some lovely work, um, not necessarily breakthrough stuff, but nice consolidating stuff around adherence, uh, difficulties with adherence. There was a beautiful um, uh, session on the last evening of, you know, Friday evening last session on adolescence that I hope was webcast. I'm not sure if it was. I hope it was because it's worth looking that up uh, if indeed it it was. Um, there were four excellent presenters and they just uh, brought a lovely adolescent flavor to the whole meeting. Hmm. Um, so I'll encourage Jill to go and look at that. Uh, but otherwise, no, I'm afraid no new breakthroughs other than the fact that obviously we're hoping the long actings will really be a breakthrough for this population uh, when they roll the age down. They haven't yet done so, but hopefully we'll start to see uh, adolescents getting on to long-acting cabotegravir, etc., as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Do you foresee any any sort of uh, uh, legal issues with regard to prevention below 18, or not really in South Africa, in Southern Africa? Um, we're hoping not. <laughs> um, I spoke to Bob Grant at in Boston to make sure that WHO was not going to put any sort of age uh, into their guidelines and I guess we'll have to see the implementation guidelines but his feeling and and Gottfried was there and so was Peter uh, Gottfried Fawcett and you know other people were there saying no there would not be an age restriction on PrEP uh, that really the recommendation will be that it is should be made available to anyone who's at substantive risk of HIV acquisition. And that's obviously really important both for young women in Africa but also men who have sex with men all around the world So and young sex workers obviously. So I, I hope that we're not going to see any kind of limitations. South African guidelines have been written for MSM and for sex workers um, and for discordant couples and we are in the process of writing the, the young woman and adolescent girl guidelines at the moment. So I haven't yet, you know, we're in the process, but we're hoping also there's not going to be any limitation uh, in terms of regulation. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Would you like to add anything, Jim? I'll just point out for, for folks on the call, most people probably know that in the United States, the uh, Truvada as PrEP is indicated for 18 and above by the FDA. And uh, this, the study that uh, Linda Gale mentioned that Sybil Hosek is leading, ATN113, which uh, had young gay boys, really, from the age of 15 to 17 taking PrEP. We're hoping that that data will help 
provide enough evidence and impetus to lower the age, the FDA uh, recommendation. Uh, it should be said, though, even though that the FDA indicates 18 and above, Truvada as PrEP can be prescribed, what would we call off-label, so under the age of 18. And we're hearing across the country, um, at the grassroots, at the, at the site level, that um, this is happening and, and insurance companies are covering it. Oftentimes, insurance doesn't cover things that are off-label, but we've been hearing fairly positive reports there. That said, um, it's always better to have you know, guidance and indications and regulations matching up with what we need. So we continue to push that and advocates have been continuing to push um, both the research side and the maker, Gilead, to um, work with us to lower that indication. Mm -hmm. Okay, excellent. Maybe then we, we can talk a bit uh, about MSM and trans women at this point. Uh, what would you think uh, were the main points presented at CROI regarding options for these groups? Well, I'll jump in. I'll start and turn it over to Linda Gale. Um, I, I think it's, you know, I, I mentioned earlier this recommendation to switch to quarterly screening. I think that's important, quarterly STD screening for whatever population, but certainly for gay men and trans women. Um, for gay men, especially gay black men, there was a great study that was presented called HPTN 073 that um, it was, it's worth going and listening to and checking out on the CROI website. They uh, very helpfully have all of that organized and you can pretty much listen in and look at everything that was presented at CROI. Uh, and what they really talked about was um, holistic care for black gay men, like we can't have PrEP programming that is specific to PrEP. It can't just be about PrEP and HIV prevention. We all have other needs that go beyond that. So meeting people where they are and, and helping them get the services that they need as opposed to the services we want them to take um, is, shows very high uptake. So when people are brought in and they're offered support in whatever direction they need, and if they want to choose PrEP, they can choose PrEP. If they need something else, they get something else. If they defer going on PrEP, if they go on PrEP and then go off PrEP, the kind of package of services and care and support and referrals stays there. And I think that's how we need to be thinking about how we deliver this programming everywhere, that it is part of holistic health care, that it includes things like housing and employment. And for transgender women, this wasn't brought out in that study specifically, but we've, we certainly know this from the ground, that um, transgender women in much of the world care very much about hormone therapy, and they want hormones, they want access to feminizing hormones. So programs that are doing HIV prevention, inclusive of PrEP, need to meet transgender women where they're at and provide them hormone therapy. Hormone therapy is often the number one concern need and desire. And if you aren't able to do that, you're not going to, they're not going to follow you anywhere else. Like you have to meet people where they're at. So 073 really brought that home. I think this is all stuff we know. I, I guess it's nice to see it scientifically presented at an important conference. Um, but it also, now we've known this, now it's becoming more and more officially known, and we really don't have any excuses not to design programs that don't meet people um, from a holistic uh, viewpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, about so, that, uh, yeah, so, sorry, sorry. Sorry. so Carlos, I would just again draw people's attention to fantastic plenaries at Boston. I have to say, you know, I could not fault a single one of them. And Tonia Poteet um, did a really terrific job. Um, of of a plenary on a transgendered individuals, it was it was insightful and factual and just fabulous. So that was. definitely was webcast, um, and people should go and check that out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I totally agree. It was one of my favorite sessions of the whole meeting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm actually editing. Uh, Special issue, we're looking at uh, transgender, one of the papers is actually transgender uh, women and uh, and PrEP, and apparently there's still uh, concerns about the possibility of interaction between uh, certain kinds of hormones and, 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 and PrEP. 
No, so I wonder if anything of that was discussed at, at the conference. I, they may have been on posters, so again, I encourage people to go and have a look. I, I must say that I missed that, but my comment about that, Carlos, would be that, you know, the, the notion of pre and post dosing in a sort of event-driven approach uh, to PrEP is certainly not off the cards, and it was discussed at quite a lot of length at CROI, um, and certainly that becomes an option where, you know, transgendered woman or anybody for that matter is, is engaged in using more than one drug, so where there's polypharmacy to try and reduce drug-drug reactions, you know, is, is clearly it's helpful to try and reduce exposure um, to specific agents. So, um, uh, you know, I, I think work needs to be done in this regard, but I just wanted to raise that uh, the daily dosing is there, but there was quite a lot said about um, uh, event-driven dosing as well. Clearly, those studies need to be done. I'm, I'm not saying for a moment one should just go down that route, but I think we need to keep, for the reasons that you're raising, the sort of complicated populations we have, we do need to keep all our options open. And I will say, what we know anecdotally um, is that many transgender women are receiving hormone therapy and PrEP. And because the PrEP program and hormone replace and hormone therapy um, require frequent visits to your provider, if there is something going on, it can be addressed. But I know of many providers who are providing both to their transgender women and not seeing big issues. Not to say again, like Linda Gale said, we should we still need more data. We need to explore these things and not rely just sort of on experience or anecdote, but actually get it in the science. But what we are seeing, we're not seeing these concerns borne out in the real world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Anything to, to comment on, on the, the case reported and discussed about the uh, HIV infection among or uh, in a man mm. taking PrEP? Mm. So just to, um, and I'm sure Jim has some, in fact I've seen Jim write uh, on this subject, but just to appraise people of what uh, the story was, it was a single case study of a man um, who um, claimed to be adherent to his PrEP, um, but became infected with a multi-drug resistant HIV, including resistant to uh, TDFFTC. Um, and so that got a lot of airtime. There was baseline resistance testing showing multiple NRTI, NNRTI, and integrase associated mutations. So a highly unusual virus. Um, and unfortunately, this, this gay man uh, became infected with it. Um, and, uh, you know, it looks like a, a case of breakthrough infection. Uh, but a, a lot of people have had a number of different um, opinions about this, and uh, so I'll give Jim the last word on that one. Sure, thank yeah. you. Thanks for that Actually, great. Jim, just before, uh, I mean, if you could, um, after you respond to this, you could talk us, uh, uh, share your ideas about uh, what you presented. I mean, uh, it was really great, and we would like to hear about it. I mean, prepare for love. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, please. So I'm going to talk rapid fire. So regarding this breakthrough case, I think as we all, you know, this isn't what anyone wanted to hear or see, um, but we need to put it in context. It's one person out of tens of thousands of people taking PrEP. Um, we don't have exact numbers, but we could look, be looking at 40, 50,000 people on PrEP currently outside of clinical trials, and before that, during clinical trials, thousands more. And PrEP isn't perfect. Nothing is. If you want perfect, you're on the wrong planet. If you want 100%, you don't have sex. And we know what kind of failure rate abstinence has. We also know that condoms have high failure rates. And we continue to talk about uh, condoms and include condoms in our messaging, even knowing that they don't work perfectly. That even wearing them perfect, as perfectly as you can, don't confer 100% protection. So I think we just need to remember that this was a very rare instance, a very rare virus. When you have that many different resistances going on, it is a less fit virus, less likely to infect somebody. It did happen. It does look like he was um, uh, adherent from everything we can understand. 
but you know we have to keep in, in perspective. And I think finally on that, the the silver lining here is is because he was on prep and seeing someone regularly, they caught his infection really early and were able to segue him into care. And despite having a virus with a number of resistance profiles going on, he is now completely undetectable and healthy. So because he was on PrEP, he was able to get into care quickly. Now, if he hadn't been on PrEP and was a, a occasional condom user, a never condom user, and who knows how often going to your doctor, maybe once in a while, maybe close to never, who knows how long that infection could have gone on without being detected. So. Um, we don't want people to test positive, obviously, but if you're going to test positive, finding out soon and getting into the care and treatment you, you need and deserve is, is a good thing. Finally, um, quick note about Prep for Love. I did a talk on it. It is on the CROI site. If you, wanna, um, if you want you know, to spend 20 minutes listening to more of me. Uh, but we're very excited about it. It's a, it's a sex-positive, pleasure-based, intimacy-based campaign. It features um, gay men, um, black cisgender uh, men and women, and a transgender couple, or a woman who's transgender in a, uh, a woman, a male-female couple. So it really um, goes across three key populations. They're all people of color. We have eight mo we had eight models, uh, seven of whom are uh, identified as black and one identified as white. Um, and our message is really simple, is that with PrEP you can have the sex you want. You can, you can have pleasure and intimacy and connection. You can feel the heat. You can spread, tingle um, without worrying about HIV. Um, that HIV can be set aside and HIV has played such a huge role in so many of our sex lives, diminishing our sex lives, bringing fear and danger into our bedrooms. We can now set that aside and, um, with PrEP. So, we launched that uh, actually February 1st in Chicago, and I had the great opportunity to talk about it at Croy. And I know we're uh, towards the end here, so I won't say more, but if you are interested, you can go look it up on the site. It was webcast. And if you want to find out more from me or want to hear how we did it or want you know, to talk about it, um, I'm also very happy to be approached uh, outside of this and you know, follow up with people individually. Mm. Uh, it's excellent. and. Definitely what you guys have been doing is really very much needed because uh, definitely as, uh, we still need to talk much more and much more openly about, about PrEP and many ideas still have to change among many people, unfortunately. But we'll, we'll, we'll do it. I think it's going to happen at some point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and, and definitely regarding the, the case of infection, it would be interesting to uh, probably we have a, an overall figure of, uh, of uh, PrEP effectiveness uh, and maybe um, we can look at what those cases where it's not effective uh, they, maybe they are about uh, resistant viruses maybe they are about acute infection where virema is much higher so probably mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if that has actually been studied or, or not and uh, may, I wonder if that would, could be something we, uh, we could look at, no? uh, researchers could look at. One uh, last point, I wonder if, uh, I, I was just thinking that um, the, the, the vaginal uh, devices could have, I mean, I, I don't know if anybody has looked at uh, the possibility of using them for, to prevent the infection from uh, a woman with HIV to a man without HIV. I, I don't know if it's a crazy, crazy question at all or not, no? but I was just wondering if people have looked at that. Do you know uh, Linda Gale? Does it make any sense or, or not? Uh, the, the, the worry there would be that you're exposing, um, I mean, unless the woman is also on antiretrovirals, in which case... Yeah. Exactly. She doesn't need the vaginal product, but if she just uses the vaginal product, then she's going to expose herself. There is some systemic absorption, uh, low levels, and so we don't want her virus to be exposed to those low systemic levels. So, um, so yeah, I would not advise that, and I don't think um, you know that that's likely to get airtime uh, in the near future, um, Carlos, for the reasons of resistance. 
Absolutely. No, I was uh, I was thinking of, of a woman who would also be taking um, uh, systemic therapy with the same drugs, although maybe uh, not virus suppressed yet. No, something like that. But anyway. Yeah. So, mm. Anyway, uh, I think it has been a very informative uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. I really, really appreciate your uh, the presence of presence of you both, uh, Linda, Gail, and, and Jim. Thank you very much for your generosity sharing an hour with us here today. As you all know, this has been recorded and it's going to be uploaded to our YouTube uh, channel later and shared through the list serve. So again, thank you all. Uh, thank Thanks. you both for being here and, and we'll keep in touch. Okay? Thanks for everyone thank attending. You, appreciate it, Carlos. Bye. Thank Bye. you.